Oh, Tina, kia ora, Bob. Uh, kia ora, Tato. Um, yeah, I'd like to dedicate uh, the seminar to Mormon Simon, who uh, from Kafaiki Wanganui, and uh, he was uh, our teacher, our mentor at Hotabata College in Fielding, and uh, he's the reason why many of us speak Māori, sing really well, <laughs> and um, have always just believed that there is something about Māori culture that's special, that's unique, and that um, helps us in our, I don't want to use the word well-being, but it just, you know, it spurs us along. So kia ora tato. Uh, my name's Atafai. Uh, I've had the pleasure and the privilege to be involved with Te Kupinga from the get-go. Um, so what we're going to talk today about is how Te Kupinga, which is a net, is helping us to, well, has helped us capture better information about Māori well-being, and we mean Māori well-being in the broadest sense. And we'll go through that. <coughs> um, so it really was uh, designed and developed to provide an overall picture of social, cultural and economic well-being of Māori in New Zealand. And um, as a subset of that, you know, if you think, well, we can get some social stuff, some economic stuff, cultural stuff, well, we should be able to provide some better estimates about key aspects of Māori culture and language. Measuring Māori well-being, really? Uh, it's hard enough to measure well-being. I think any of us who's worked, who have worked in this space realise that it is a contested area. Um, you know, is economics more important? Social more important? And what is the role of culture? Um, these are really the challenges that we've had to face from the get-go. And luckily, to be fair, we've had a lot of help by leveraging off, I would say, the wisdom and understanding that we do have um, from various surveys that we have, from various data sources we have about aspects of social well-being, um, things like overall life satisfaction, that's you know like a, a measure that people like Stiglitz and others have talked about to kind of give a, a the, the more personalised aspect of how well you're doing as opposed to the economic side where we can count people's incomes, household incomes, uh, we can get a broad picture of if you're working or not, we can get an understanding, you kind of pull those strands together and you get a sense of well what's going on, what's happening, what are the tensions and really the issue was to get a sense of cultural well-being um, and the multicultural dimension. I just want to thank uh, a whole range of people uh, who have helped us in this in this journey to try to define what I'd call a kete or a chit, a basket of measures that might be useful to understanding Māori culture in its depth and in its fullness. Um, so in particular, we had a lot of help from Massey University, um, Mason Jury's people. It would be fair to say that if there's a person who is the guru of Māori well-being in terms of its measurement, statistically, quantitatively, it is Mason. So the work that he did, uh, Te Hoi Nukuro, which is a longitudinal survey, I mean, him and his team trying to measure the cultural dimension, we gained a lot of wisdom and support from them. Um, people like El John, people like um, Chris Cunningham, Te Kanikini, you know, the range of people that they worked with. Um, they, they tried to measure this stuff in the 90s and they gave us their questionnaire, they gave us their knowledge, they gave us their wisdom, and to be fair, a lot of it kind of sat in place with a lot of the things we'd already heard from other people. Linda Smith's work, I think the people that work in the science area, I mean, sorry, the, the health area. I see Ricky and Donna are here, and they were really good people to talk to in terms of what's happening in the health <coughs> sector. All of these people came together, they came on board. Um, if anything, perhaps my biggest role was helping to connect those people um, and uh, bring them in to become part of, part of the party to say, we're trying to measure this statistically. We want to come up with evidence, um, capture a na national picture, get some regional and some age understanding of what's going on with culture, but also looking at the, the, the breadth of it. So if I just kind of briefly go through what we ended up with. Um, I've got the saying, comes from my brother, Te Kuping is really something old, something new, something borrowed, something to to do. So what I mean by that is, uh, we were able to get to Kupinga 
running, working, based upon the gifts that other people have given us in terms of a whole lot of uh, modules and questionnaires and things that we knew worked and gave us a sense of kind of the different strands of well-being that we were researching because researchers had done this before us. And then we also had to think about some new things and I see my mate Peter Pontag over there and I might talk a little bit about some of those things. But um, if I go through what the Kupinga does and what it provides, we get the data set is a post-sensual survey, yeah? So all the general demography stuff comes directly from the uh, from census. So we sampled Māori Dung, which is sent adults 15 plus, the best address book ever, New Zealand census, okay? So all their information about age, sex, location, just to make sure that our weights are right, that it's totally representative of the Māori population, because we're a post-sensual survey, because we were able to convince the government statistician that we should be able to use some of that data as well. That's all the data data set. Okay? Um, social. I want to thank the GSS people in terms of uh, Phil Walker and his team. See Bronwyn there. Um, the NZ GSS is really a general social well-being uh, survey. It's been going for at least two or three. Phil? Three. Three. So it's a rich data set. Um, it measures things like loneliness, um, it's got a short form health assessment tool, it's an SF12, not an SF36. Um, what else? Um, measures of discrimination, um, experiences of discrimination, experiences of crime, trust, uh, loneliness. So all those things I mentioned, we were able to borrow that stuff. Um, and could I say we borrowed it on a simple premise that Phil reminds me of, Māori are not aliens. What do I mean by that? Uh, if you cut us, we feel pain. We want jobs, you know. We need to connect with people. So it just makes sense that we need to grab that stuff. It was already made, but it also made a lot of sense. It's all in our data set. It's all in our questionnaire. <coughs> On the economic side, uh, again, household variables. Household income, uh, probably size of household, household relationships, there's more on the social side. But, you know, any income stuff, any employment stuff, within um, census that's relevant to ideas and notions of well-being, it's within the TK data set. Material well-being, well-being index, so my friend Brian Perry's LC measures, they're in TK, they're in Tukupina. We're able to grab that stuff and say, hey, this, this just makes sense. It needs to be part of our broad picture, what is well-being for Māori. Um, and the real trick really was the cultural side. So we had health of the Māori language questions and understanding and knowledge from 2001 when Stats New Zealand and TPK first measured proficiency, use of the Māori language inside and outside the home. So it's like, okay, went to talk to TPK, <coughs> they wanted all of that, couldn't fit it all in, kept the key elements. Uh, what else have we got in there? Um, obviously from Tehunukuro, what we really got from them was the confidence that there are a number of things that people may criticise as being essentialism, but there are some essential things in terms of Māori society and Māori culture that we want to count. We want to understand how many people know not just their marae, or have been to a marae, or any marae, but how many know their ancestral marae? How many people have connected with their ancestral marae, their marae tipuna? Which we know, you know, when we talk to the elders, we talk to people, we talk to the researchers, that stuff's, that stuff's yeah. important. So we captured that stuff in terms of uh, a sense of tūranga waiwai, so we leveraged off the back of, well, you can ask subjective questions of people about how they feel about their life overall. What about a subjective question to people about how connected do they feel to their marae tipuna, or to their tūranga waiwai? So that's in TK. Um, what else do we have in TK? We have, sorry, TK is my shorthand for tiku whanau. Um, whānau, again, you know whānau, anybody's worked in the whānau space, and it's really, really hard to measure. Because Fano is Fano family. Is family and Fano the same thing? Uh, we measure households and statistics. We don't measure Fano, we measure households. We don't measure families, we measure households. We get on the same relationships within the household. Again, leveraging off the, um, off the subjective element, or well, couldn't we just ask an individual who's a member of a Fano, how well is your Fano doing? What do you think? And couldn't we connect that data to all the rest of the data that we might have about them in terms of their household, household income, overall life satisfaction. Yes, we can, and we've done it. Um, 
Whānau is an interesting thing too because the question that was coming in the in the Māori space, in the Māori context was, or is, Whānau, is that whakapapa? Like, cousins? Cousins? Does it include friends? Big arguments, say eh, Pete? There's, there was tension in the room. People were saying, it's all whakapapa. All those other people, they're not your whānau. And then you know, you develop people saying, well, sometimes they are. What you're going to see today is that Peter was right. And so were the other people. <laughs> <laughs> but more will be revealed. Okay? So again, you know, just ask the question. Just ask the question. Who is in your whānau? Have a little grid there. Mum, dad, kids, grandparents, cousins, friends. Get people to speak for themselves. Who do they define as their whānau? Um, so we have that information. Whānau contact, which is really a social survey uh, measure in terms of how often you contact your whānau, do you contact them enough? You know, we've adapted that. Um, I should say a special thanks to Phil Walker because he really did the conceptual thinking. I might have done some of the cultural stuff and we got uh, Peter and Luke in the room and we you know, had a bit of a whining about you know, what's important to Māori from what we read in the literature and from what we know in terms of grounded stuff. But Phil really did the hard work in terms of, well, this is what we're finding in other surveys, let's test this. I think in summary, uh, before I pass it over to Spotty, uh, Te Kupinga is a really broad data set. The magic of Te Kupinga is not our first release results. The first release results we're going to talk about today is what I call the Māpahi Pōnama. It's the precious treasure. It's the green stone. It's the stuff in terms of Māori culture and Māori identity we've never really measured before and we wanted to show it to the people who really backed us and said please come up with this stuff, please help us understand it with the evidence. Um, so that's really what we're going to present today. But what we present today is the tip of the iceberg because underneath the water is this ability for people to see in the data set all these different dimensions of their life. And what people want to do smart, good analysis, we really want to encourage you to come and grab this data set and see what information that is representative of the Māori adult population, what can you find, what can you do. So I'm going to pass it over to Scott now and Scott's going to go through the numbers. Can I ask a really quick question? Sorry. What is the data cycle going to be? Is it going to be a five year cycle to redo the data sets? That's a good question. <laughs> we, so you're, you're right, we, this is the first, yeah, this is the first, and I think, like anything in government, I think it would be fair to say, we use it, you know, we need to encourage use, we've got to make sure that people are saying, oh, they, they, they're going to quote and say TK is useful, because with respect, I know when I've gone around and promoted this data set with the Māori community, they love it, but then, you know, what we really need is the data usage community to say, oh, this has been very helpful. This is uh, giving us information. You've just reminded me, as you say that, which is not related to your question, but I, I want to say this too. In the TK data set, we also ask people about, do they know their iwi, their pepeha? Aspects of their pepeha? Are they registered with their iwi? Did they vote at the last iwi elections? Uh, I just saw Pete, so. Uh, so just the voting stuff too, you know, we, so we have, we have uh, in terms of civic participation, we have people saying whether or not they were involved in the local elections, national elections, iwi elections. We think that this will be useful at a macro level for people who are thinking about questions about iwi engagement and whether or not you know people are connecting or is this just knowledge that sits in their head that they learned at Te Wānanga o Aotearoa, are they utilising it? Or Te Wānanga o <laughs> um, Michelle, there's a good question. I think, you know, to be fair, we don't know the answer. But what we do know is, our job right now is to promote the starter set and to make sure that as many people are using it mm. and maybe finding flaws with it, whatever. Whatever data users say, that's good because it's going to help us, if and when we get to do the next one, to come up with a better, a better survey. Uh, so, kia ora. Other than that, oh, I, I mean, this is the thing I, I've been going around to different organisations and promoting TK. And one of the things I find is, this is on the paper, you know, one day, and the bigger headline is, teacher interviews 50 teachers, you know, researcher interviews 50 teachers and finds out that they're racist. 50 teachers, I'm like, oh, there's 5,500 people, mate. 
this is representative. I mean, you know, that stuff is good. It tells you something. This is gold standard stuff with respect. That's what we do at Stats New Zealand. You know, we, we have, you know, we do, we do nationally representative stuff, you know, and I just want to make sure that people get that. Because when I talk to my own community, they go, oh, yeah, that's like that other stuff that that lady did on TV. No, 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 no. That's an internet poll, cuz. <laughs> you know, and not everybody's on the internet, as you know, you know. So I just wanted to just to impress upon people. It is all Māori adults, 15 plus. I'd encourage you all to go to the website. There are some groups that aren't in this, you know, like uh, I don't think Funny Cody's in this just because of distance. Um, I should say quickly about the methodology. It was door to door, door to door, knock on the door. Once we got the sample, we send our interviewers there. Um, and it's an interview, 45 minutes. Some of, them, some of the interviewers said, yeah, 45 minutes turned into two hours. Because they want us to have a cup of tea, they want to sit down with us, they want to have a call at all. They want to explain to us, this is what it really means. So we had a number of those stories, but yeah. Um, all of those who are familiar with Kaupapa Māori method, we do the best that we can, but we are not a Kaupapa Māori method. Okay? That's just a fact. We're Kaupapa Kawanatanga method. Is that a real term? Donna? It is now. <laughs> So, uh, without further ado, you guys want to hear the numbers? Here's Scotty. Kia ora, Atapai. Um, kia ora, Tato. Um, thanks for coming to listen to us. Um, I don't think anyone's quite mentioned yet, but on Tuesday we were all very excited at Stats New Zealand because after uh, probably roughly about six years of development, we released the first information from Te Kupinga. So, um, it was quite... Yeah, it was quite exciting for, for a number of us, I mean, it's probably a bit geeky, exciting about this, but <laughs> never mind. Um, so I'm going to talk to you quickly today about some of the highlights from that first release of information that we put out on Tuesday. Um, that first release of information was focused on uh, the Māori culture stuff that Artifice talked about. We deliberately focused on that. We steered away from the social and the economic stuff because there's stuff out there already about that and a lot of the cultural stuff's new, so we wanted to get it out there first. Um, again, I just want to emphasise what Artify said just briefly before, is that um, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, the real benefit in Tekuping is it's a research data set, and we've given high-level overview statistics. So what we're really trying to do now is show people these high-level overview statistics to encourage people to use the data, dig into more, and you know, start providing some evidence about Māori. Um, before we dig into some specific areas of Māori culture, I'm going to kind of set the scene a little bit with a question that Te Kupinga asked at the beginning about how Māori adults, how important Māori adults felt culture was to them. Um, and as this graph will show now, um, 9 out of 10 Māori said that um, Māori culture was important to them to some degree. There were only 10% of Māori adults who actually said Māori culture is not important to me at all. Um, this trend was um, very similar across age groups. There's really no difference in age groups. Younger people were just as likely to say uh, culture is important to me. So I guess based on this sort of finding at the beginning gives us a good good starting point to say, look, this is why we're looking at culture, because actually it is really important to Māori. Yeah. Um, oh, no, go back. Are you going to go back? Yeah. I just, oh no, sorry, the next one. So we're well organised here. We went through this a couple of um, He's supposed yeah. to do a secret whistle. <laughs> um, so the first area we're going to kind of look at is around tikanga. Um, and Māori connect and engage with the culture in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a more traditional way of people knowing their pipiha, their iwi, their ancestral marae, and then um, visiting that ancestral marae and other traditional places, such things like that. But then, you know, there's the more contemporary way that people connect with their culture. And, for example, by enrolling in a te reo course or being part of kapahaka. Um, and Te Kuping has looked across all these traditional and contemporary, maybe we've covered everything, but we've covered a good deal of ways that people engage in their culture. 
Um, we found uh, nine in ten Māori adults knew their iwi. This was the most common aspect of their pepeha that they knew. And actually this is very, well, it's quite consistent with census results, which is slightly different, but which would show that around 84-85% of Māori can state their iwi. So it's roughly quite similar. You know, most, iwi, most Māori can, can name their iwi, basically. Um, in addition to that, 71% uh, of people knew their ancestral marae or their marae tipuna. 58% uh, knew their maunga. And similar numbers kind of knew their awa, their hapu, their waka, and their tipuna. Uh, four, four out of ten Māori uh, actually knew all of these aspects of their pepeha. And only 7% of Māori adults actually knew none of them. So, you know, quite a bit of knowledge there about the traditional, uh, traditional connections. Again, on the age-related thing, actually, uh, it is true older Māori were actually more, were more likely to know aspects of their pepeha than younger Māori, with uh, around 42% uh, of Māori age 55 plus knowing all aspects, compared with only around 24% of 15 to 24-year-olds who knew all aspects. So as we showed on the previous slide, um, I'm going to show, actually, my heading's gone, but what I'm going to show on this slide is something about how well uh, Māori connect to their tūranga waiwai. Um, as we showed in the previous slide, there are around 3 in 10 Māori who actually don't know their ancestral marae. Um, and there's another 17% who actually know their ancestral marae, but they actually don't think of that marae as their tūranga waiwai. They may not have a tūranga waiwai, they may think of something else as their tūranga waiwai. So we're left with around 54% of Māori adults who thought of their ancestral marae as their tūranga waiwai. Of those, um, of these, or 36% this one? Yeah, no, no, no. Go back. Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, so that means that 36% of Māori adults said they, were, they felt strongly or very strongly connected to their tūranga waiwai, which is their ancestral marae, while another 12% uh, felt somewhat connected. So we're, over half of Māori basically have felt, have felt connected to their tūranga waiwai. Um, Again, a bit of a story within the age groups. Uh, older Māori, 55 plus, were more likely than younger Māori to have an ancestral marae and to have thought of that ancestral marae as their tūranga waiwai. They were also more likely to feel strongly connected to their tūranga, uh, to their tūranga waiwai. With, um, I think, just uh, five and 10 older Māori, 55 plus, said they were very strongly or strongly, felt very strongly or strongly connected to their Tūranga Waiwai. Cool. And then just a little bit on people visiting their ancestral marae. Um, of all Māori adults, whether they knew their ancestral marae or not, six out of ten had ever been to their ancestral marae. So they, they'd visited their ancestral marae at some point in their life. Um, and this included 34% who had visited in the last year. Um, so, just some numbers around that. Um, of those, of the Māori adults who knew their ancestral marae though, 6 out of 10 <coughs> said they would like to have gone more or have gone at all. Um, so people are still will it wanting, actually. Most Māori are still wanting to actually go to their marae more often. And we looked at um, what were some of the main barriers to Māori attempt, visiting their marae more often. And we found that cost was the main barrier to, um, that they reported for not going more often, uh, followed by lack of time, and then uh, no invite or occasion to be invited to, 
and then there were some other more little ones. But those three things around cost, lack of time, no invite or no occasion were the main reasons people were finding they couldn't get to their ancestral island. Moving on to some of the more uh, modern ways that people, I guess, are engaging with their culture or connecting with their culture. The most commonly reported way uh, that people connected was through watching a television, a Māori show on television. Mm -hmm. uh, not a show on Māori television, but any Māori show on television could be to cut it in. And three quarters of Māori um, are watching a Māori television programme in the last four weeks. So, a lot of watching going on. Um, the other common ways that we found were exploring their whakapapa, uh, taking part in kapahaka or other performing arts, uh, wearing Māori jewellery, or um, another one, four out of ten Māori, uh, connecting with Māori through social networking sites, and Artify is one of those. <laughs> um, one thing we did <laughs> with this one, we kind of had a list of these things, basically there's probably 15 different activities that we asked people about. We also had a question on um, what other things you did um, to try and get a sense, given it's our first time at Te Finger, whether we'd missed any things that people were doing that we hadn't thought about. In general, we actually picked up most things. Um, these were the most common. Other people were really just putting... Open text. Yeah, yeah, so it was open text, sorry. Open text, people could just write anything in. And while a lot of people wrote things in, they were basically just repeating stuff that were actually already in this list. So we, we, we generally think we picked up most of the stuff pretty well. The next slide's just a continuation. Some more of the stuff that we looked at. Uh, 34% listen to uh, Māori radio station, 25% uh, read a Māori magazine. 15% have a tāmoko. <laughs> Artify is quite interested in this, but yeah, so yeah, some interesting stuff there. Um, feel free to. It's all in the. It's all in the first release. That stuff anyway, so you can go through it in your own time. Um, so moving on to the Te Reo Māori section, um, obviously, um, yeah, leave it there, leave it there. <laughs> um, so obviously, we, 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 um, Te Reo Māori was an important part of the cultural, cultural areas for us because, you know, we saw it as a way of people, a way of Māori connecting with their culture. It's not as a standalone thing, but as part of, pe part of connecting with culture. And what we did with um, Te Kupinga is we basically used, repeated the questions from the 2001 Health of the Māori Language Survey um, so that we could increase comparability and make a couple of comparisons. We've already jumped to the slide, you'll see it. Um, so the, 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 the two surveys, 2001 and Te Kupinga in 2013, they do have quite similar methodologies in a lot of things, but there are some differences that uh, we go into a bit more detail in the report, but or in the first release. But um, you know, there are some differences that just need to be, I guess, a bit aware of that could lead to some differences. That's what I get there. But but at that said, um, we compared them because um, they were close. They were pretty good. And what we found is that in 2013, an estimated 260,000 or 55 percent of Maori adults. Uh, reported that they had some ability to speak Te Reo Māori. That is, they could speak m uh, more than a few words or phrases. Um, overall, there were 50,000 or 11 per cent who could speak Te, Ma te Reo Māori very well or well. Um, and the remaining 44 per cent were in the fairly well or not very well um, categories. So in comparison to 2001, um, there, was a, there was obviously quite a large increase in the number or the proportion of people speaking not very well. Um, that's where we've kind of seen the biggest increase. Um, things around the very well, well have stayed split, uh, quite flat in terms of proportions of Māori adults. They've gone up slightly in terms of numbers, 
because of the increasing population. But, um, but that's kind of, I think, the general picture we're seeing. Increases in low, uh, lower proficiency speakers of today and fairly fat at the, flat at the high levels. One, yep, okay. Um, so, I raise this question. So, how does this relate to census data? Because obviously, not long ago, we came out with census data, which said that um, number of Te Reo speakers is decreasing since 2001, since 2006. In fact, census shows it's been going down since 1996. So, how do we compare? Obviously, they're two different uh, surveys, or surveys and census, and they're different questions. They're similar and they're self-reported questions, but census is a yes, no, I can speak Māori, I can't speak Māori. Whereas the kūpinga has a lot more depth around just showing the levels of proficiencies. And um, so that's one important thing to keep in mind. Um, the key thing is, I think, that we're seeing in te kūpinga the big increases across the lower level proficiencies. Uh, we believe it's something that census is not necessarily picking up. It's just kind of looking at the, maybe the higher level proficiencies. Um, so it's something we've looked at briefly at the moment, but need to do a bit more work on. I think the key thing is, and uh, the important thing about Te Kupinga Te Reo data, is that both measures census and Te, Reo, uh, te Kupinga enrich an overall picture of Te Reo Māori use. And, um, and to know, um, to Kuping, it doesn't just look at one thing either. I mean, there's just, we've shown the proficiency measure, but actually we've got other measures we'll show in a minute that are around use and inside the home, outside, outside the home, um, things speakers. other than speaking, native speakers. And it's kind of, I guess, important to consider all the different things when considering what's, what's happening to the language and um, that's something we'll be doing in uh, the next report we put, put out which is a more in-depth report around Te Reo Māori in Māori Language Week in July which will go into more detail some of this stuff in that report. Cool. Um, so I did talk about the large increases have come in the lower proficiencies. That increase has also been driven by younger people. Um, see from this graph the large increases have come in the younger groups, uh, 15 to 24, 25 to 34, even the 35 to 44, seeing large increases in the number of Māori people who can speak some te reo. And at the high, older levels, it's, it's still quite flat. Um, but we are still seeing that the older people are the ones who can speak it very well, at the high, high proficiency levels, the very well and the well. There's still a lot higher proportion of older people speaking at that level. So important not to forget that that's still there, but uh, 2001 survey showed that those numbers or those proportion are decreasing. So something going on there, which you know, we kind of know that the older <coughs> speakers are dying off type thing. Cool. I uh, talked about <coughs> other measures. So, Te Kuping is asks about use of Te Reo. And um, so, it's basically asks about use of Te Reo in the home and outside the home. This graph is about the use of Te Reo inside the home. Um, around 165 Māori adults reported speaking some Te Reo within the home. Um, so it's actually lower levels than the amount that are saying they can speak some left, some today. And this equates to around 64% of people who said they could speak more than a few words or phrases. So I guess only a two, two thirds of people who say they can speak more than a few words or phrases are actually using it to some extent in the home. Um, and, and the people who do speak in the home are most commonly speaking to children in the home, um, less so to partners and parents and things like that, but most commonly to children. 80% of 
80% of Māori adults living with preschool children spoke some te reo Māori to them in the home. And that includes 2 in 10 who were speaking at least half or more te reo Māori in the home. The level of inside the home has been fairly consistent with 2001 levels. I might skip the outside one. Move on to some um, Fano Fano measures. Artifies kind of already introduced why we looked at the Fano stuff. Um, first of all, I mean, we started with a, like we we kind of did some more subjective stuff around Fano. Obviously, like Artifies said, statistics basically does households. Um, so Fano, we kind of had to think a little bit outside the box. Um, we drew on <coughs> Phil's subjective overall life, it's not Phil, yeah. GSS's <laughs> overall life satisfaction, and we said, let's not only ask how well they're doing, but let's um, actually ask them how well their whānau are doing. So what I've got here is an individual's perception of how well their whānau is doing. And we'll see over 80% of, actually, yeah, 8 out, eight out of 10, 83% of Māori are saying, my whānau is doing either extremely well or well, most the same well. Um, so, you, you know. Do you how interesting the tail is? The tail? Well, there's not much tail. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. Less than, I guess less than 5% are saying, or around 5% are saying badly or extremely badly. My whanau's doing badly or extremely badly. Ah, uh, you know, some people may say, oh yeah, but that doesn't actually, is it the true picture? But, you know, 5 6%, 7%, 7%, that's kind of consistent with a lot of tails we get in measures, whether we're looking at overall life satisfaction or whether we're looking at some more hard objective measures of um, socioeconomic status. Actually, you know, most people, and this includes most Māori, actually, and most whānau, are actually doing okay. And... The tail's there, yeah, and we shouldn't ignore it, but, you know, it's not as big sometimes, I think, as, um, as uh, media or other, as some people make out. Um, we also looked at how uh, how often people were connecting with their whānau, important thing, and what did we find? We found... Uh, Lots. <laughs> yeah. Lots. I mean, again, this is a GSS measure, and we found it's quite similar to GSS. 84% of Māori adults had face-to-face -face contact in the last four weeks with whānau outside their household. So, you know, people are connecting with their wider whānau outside the household. And they're doing it even more so in a, in a non-face-to-face way, where 94% of people had had uh, non-face-to-face contact in the last four weeks. Um, yeah, we move on. Okay. Uh, we also, um, you know, again following on from the household <coughs> story, we ask people, we actually ask people, how big's your whānau? Who's your whānau? So this is, a, this is a result of basically saying how many people are in your whānau? And what we found is people on average said 11. On average, the average size of whānau was 11. You know, and uh, this is, I mean, this compares to the average household size in New Zealand, which is 2.6, you know, we're obviously finding that Fano is bigger, three times bigger, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, we're actually, Fano is something different from our soul. I mean, at very basic level, that's maybe what we're finding at the moment. Fano is something different to household. And we also, people said to us, 96, I think, 96% of people said they have Fano who live outside their household. So... Um, yeah, hundred things. <laughs> hard for us once So we get, we opened it up. People tell us what you think your fano is. It range from zero to a hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. So someone out there's got a fano of a hundred thousand. <laughs> bigger than a lot of iwi. <laughs> Three iwi's are their fano. No, that's not true. I think that's Bob, was he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And then just, um, hopefully, finally. Just Peter um, Paul, take it aside. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also asked 
who, who did you include? So he said, that's your kāna, who did you include in that kāna? And this artifice said, Peter was basically right. For most people, I think it's 95%. 95% people have included there what they know, what I might say, nuclear family, parents, partners, children, brothers and children in their whānau. So, you know, virtually everyone's including those people in their whānau. No surprise. Uh, four and ten, including uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents, grandchildren, so a lesser extent, but still a lot of people including them. And then we've got about 12% of people who said, but also my whānau includes friends and others. So there's a small group, I guess or main it's a significant size, 12%, saying that actually my whānau includes friends and others. Um, put that up, but we'll move on. I mean, basically to say, I've given you a quick rundown. Um, I won't go into any more findings, so we'll save some time for questions. But um, it's all up on our website. Um, we put out a information release, which is basically the report with all the stuff in it on Tuesday. We've also produced this poster with some of the key highlights on it, which we hope might get out there and... Uh, on walls and stuff like that. Um, we've put up some NZ of our nz.stat tables um, around some of the key subjects in the information release. If anyone's inclined to go on there and play around with the data at the moment they're there. Um, there's also just normal standard tables in Excel which support all this data. Um, that's all on our website. Um, we encourage you to go into the website, have a look, get some more detail than I guess what we've given you. Um, also, just to let you know what's coming up, um, I guess the other thing is, um, also if anyone's inclined, the data set's now open for business, so like we're encouraging people, it's a research data set, get in there, use it. It's available in the in the data in our data lab from now, so if anyone wants to get in there and use it, um, start talking to us about getting something in the data lab. Um, we are, like I've, I've mentioned the Tadara report, we have kind of got a little bit of an ongoing plan for producing outputs. It'll start with the Tadara report, we'll get into some more in-depth stuff around the culture stuff maybe look at some of the social stuff and how it relates, social and economic stuff and how it relates to the cultural stuff that will kind of be ongoing. Um, so look out for more published reports from us in the future. Um, that's me. Yeah, that's it.